While I was too young to be able to appreciate the beginning of arcades, I was lucky enough to experience what I like to call the second age. As hardware became more and more powerful, developers really had a chance to run wild. I was just seven years old when Space Harrier was released, but I can pinpoint the moment I fell in love with video games as the very first time I played it. It's remained, more than any other game or series, a constant in my life ever since. In this episode, I'll be taking a look at some of the ports, the sequels, and remakes of perhaps my favorite game of all time, Space Harrier. Designed by Yu Suzuki and released by Sega in the arcades in 1985, Space Harrier was the second entry in what I like to call the Yu Suzuki 4, a series of games that utilized Sega's 16-bit superscalar arcade hardware to put the player's viewpoint behind the character, and was unlike anything anyone had ever seen before. No matter what version you're playing, the setup remains the same. A blonde-haired man, known only as Harrier, uses his rocket-powered gun to propel forward across the checkerboard stages of the Fantasy Zone. The rocket gun allows our hero to take flight at any time and move to any position on screen. This was all accomplished using an analog flight stick, which gives you an unprecedented amount of precise control that was necessary for a game that moves this fast. You're greeted to the world of Space Area by the now iconic exclamation, Welcome to the Fantasy Zone! Get ready! Along with it, the beginning notes of what I would consider my favorite piece of game music. Composed by Hiroshi Kawaguchi, aka Hero, the theme of Space Harrier is one of the longer pieces of music of the era. The world being called the Fantasy Zone actually makes a lot of sense, because it all feels like something out of a fever dream. You'd almost think that Yu Suzuki and his team at AM2 were on something when they were conceptualizing this game. Dragons, one-eyed mammoths, flying mechs, stone faces, and whatever the heck these are. Every few stages, you'll have a short time to catch your breath during a bonus stage. Carrier gets to rest his legs for a bit and hop on the back of the last dragon fighting for good, Uriah. The two of them will plow through and destroy as many environmental obstacles as possible. This is your chance to get revenge for all those indestructible towers that were giving you so many problems. With some quick reflexes and encouragement from the narrator, your journey comes to a rather abrupt end after 18 stages. You'd think, given the complexity of the arcade hardware, that Space Harrier would be extremely difficult to port to home consoles. But apparently all kinds of developers were willing to try because Space Harrier appeared on just about every platform throughout the 80s and 90s. The Master System version of Space Harrier is really great. Sure, it's quite a bit slower moving than the arcade, but even today I find it's fairly impressive. It brings nearly everything home from the arcade, which is quite a feat, especially since it was so early in the console's life. To work around the limitation of not being able to scale sprites, this version used a technique where all objects were a part of a giant background tile that updates rapidly. In fact, the only sprites on screen were Harrier himself and the shots he fired. It's not the smoothest thing in the world, it's actually pretty choppy, but not as much as you might think. I still find it a very unique way to work around a huge problem. The audio sounds great. The entire musical theme is represented, and even a decent sounding digitized scream really show what the Master System's hardware was capable of. Seeking to rectify the abrupt ending of the arcade version, Sega added a short scene of the enemy's floating castle crumbling onto the horizon, followed by an additional final boss, a fiery dragon by the name of Haya-O. This thing moves super quick and is a deserving challenge for the game's climactic battle. The Master System version is amazing. I loved it. It was beyond every expectation I could have had, and I still think it's fairly impressive today. But Space Harrier appeared on a ton of platforms, everything from MS-DOS to, oddly, Sega's direct competition. And here to tell you about some of the more notable ports is the only person I know that's as big of a fan of the game as I am. Joe from GameSack. Space Harrier was one of those games that I played a lot of in the arcade and I loved it. So when it came out on the Master System, I knew that's the home console that I had to get. And there's a version of Space Harrier for the Famicom in Japan and the graphics are like really tiny looking compared to the Master System version, but things move a little bit more smoothly, a little bit faster, but gameplay wise is just really not the greatest thing you're ever going to play. In fact, the Master System version plays a lot better. 
The TurboGrafx-16 version of Space Harrier is pretty interesting. It's very close to the arcade. In fact, it's the first home port that I saw that actually attempted to come close to the arcade. It has all the voice samples, though they don't sound very good. The biggest issue with this is it has a striped floor instead of a checkerboard floor. It just looks weird. It's not Space Harrier. I mean, the Master System could do a checkerboard floor. The NES could even do a checkerboard floor. Why not the TurboGrafx? The Game Gear version of Space Harrier was really, really odd. They took the Master System version, shrunk it down, they changed the enemies and the objects to look different, so now they look kind of like weirdly grotesque and nothing at all like the arcade, and they changed the level names and some of the colors, but it's still the same old game. You're just supposed to feel like you're getting something new, but you're not. Two years after their Master System port, Sega followed up with an exclusive game that utilized the system's severely underused 3D glasses peripheral. This game was called, shockingly, Space Harrier 3D. And this wasn't just another port of the first game with some 3D tacked on. It was a fully fledged original game. The levels and enemies this time around are more futuristic, with cityscapes lining the horizons and robot dragons as opposed to the more organic feel of the first game. I guess they figured that 3D was high tech, so they gotta make the game look high tech. Unfortunately, the scaling effect seems notably worse, and the digitized voices, while still impressive that they're even included, sound significantly worse. It's all a rather sizable step down from the original. I suppose this was expected given that they had to make concessions for the 3D tech, and the extra horsepower that was required to use it. Probably the most shining moment of Space Harrier 3D is its music. Beyond a nice rendition of the classic theme, the original stuff here is really good especially with the FM sound version of the music when played on a Sega Mark III or a Master System with an FM sound synth mod. The very next year, in 1989, along with the launch of the Sega Genesis, we finally got a true sequel. A game we are all waiting for, Space Harrier 2. But without the direct involvement of Yu Suzuki, was there even a chance this could live up to the original? This time, Harrier, completely clad in red, is off to save Fantasyland, which has fallen into crisis. I wonder if Fantasyland is the same as the Fantasy Zone. The number of stages has been cut down to a mere 13, but in an attempt to make things more interesting, you're able to select which level you want to start at. This is a cool idea, but it kind of kills any sense of progression. You could pretty much see everything that the game has to offer, with no real effort. They tried to up the ante here a lot. You even fight the first boss from the original game as a regular enemy in this one. They'd like to make you think that the original game is child's play compared to part two. And then you fight this three-headed turtle. The musical theme of Space Harrier 2 starts off pretty cool, but it slowly devolves into a fairly boring, mundane song. It's not that bad, but I think the driving music of the first game is one of the most important aspects, and that is completely lost with this new theme. After Space Harrier 2's fairly uh, unenthused response, Sega put the series on hiatus until they had the hardware to attempt a perfect arcade translation. There's a 32x version that was extremely close, but it only ran at 30 frames per second compared to the arcade 60. In fact, it would take the powerful Saturn hardware to finally accomplish this goal. Combine that version with the Saturn's mission stick for an experience that just might surpass the arcade game. I'd consider this the definitive version. So where do you go from here? Remake, right? In 2003, as part of the Sega Ages 2500 remake line, Space Harrier found itself as Volume 4. And much like the other 3D remakes in the line, it's pretty janky. They added tons of unnecessary things to the gameplay like a Panzer Dragoon style lock-on multi-shot and flash bombs where you can kill all the enemies on screen. I guess they just felt like the original gameplay was too simple. The graphics are pretty awful, adding some boring ground textures which does the look very few favors. Luckily, you can turn this off which will restore the original checkerboard look. I always thought it was weird that there's no shadow underneath Harrier at all. It looks like he's running on air when he's supposed to be on the ground. But it's not all bad. There's a pretty good version of the theme music, and the narrator finds himself in an increased role, dishing out words of support like, Cool, Harrier. You can beat them all. Marvelous. Harrier, keep it up. You got it, Harrier. But it's just started. 
There was a period where this was the only Space Harrier game that I had access to, via the Sega Ages collection, and I played it quite a bit. I think it's because of this that I kind of like the game more than I should. But there was also another Sega Ages 2500 entry, and that was a compilation disc by the amazing team at M2 that included every version of Space Harrier that Sega had released. Get ready. I should mention that there was an arcade game called Planet Harriers that was referred to as a sequel. But I honestly can't tell you much about the game because I've never even seen a machine in person, much less played it. Let's hope for an eventual home release on digital platforms like we did with the Afterburner Climax. I'd love to try it. If you've somehow never played Space Harrier, these days the best way to give it a shot is on the 3DS with the Sega Ages 3D line. It's a great conversion, and the 3D effect works perfectly for this game. It even includes the Master System only Final Boss with arcade graphics. In 2012, with the help of a friend of mine, I was very lucky to acquire a nearly perfect condition Space Harrier arcade cabinet. I played it enough these last two years to last a lifetime, but I recently decided to sell it to a local arcade. A real arcade, where it belongs. And there, it just might have the same impact on another seven-year-old kid who is ready to fall in love with video games.